Okay, we will um, go ahead and get started. We'll have a few more people come in, but I have some boring housekeeping stuff to start with, so we'll get through that and get to the good presentation. So I just want to say hello. I'm Jen Armstrong, the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Monmouth College, and it's my pleasure to host tonight's event for our amazing alumni and our fabulous presenters, Dr. Ken Kramer and Dr. Trudy Peterson. So welcome to Mexico, a pozole of culture. Before we begin, I'm gonna cover housekeeping items. So today is the event is recorded. It'll be available on the Monmouth College website next week. And for the best ex viewing experience for tonight's presentation, ensure you're in speaker modes. That can be selected at the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Your cameras are turned off right now. And at the end of the presentation, we'd like to invite you in to the room with us. So we're gonna turn on your, your cameras by promoting you to panelists. If you'd like to keep your cameras off for some reason, you can do so by selecting stop video at the bottom of your bar on your Zoom window. And attendees can also ask questions anytime during the presentation using the chat feature. And I'll um, read the question to um, Ken and Trudy. So also at the end of the presentation, you'll see a short three minute survey. We sure appreciate your feedback and suggestions that you have for future events. Um, and just to introduce our presenters, Ken Kramer, he has been a professor of biology at Monmouth College since 1993. He received his PhD from Utah State University in wildlife ecology and teaches courses in ecology, environmental science, and introductory biology. He teaches several general ed education classes on science and religion, environmentalism, and evolution, as well as the first semester seminar for freshmen, introduction to the liberal arts. Dr. Kramer is a fan of all things biological, but is especially interested in animal ecology and behavior. Dr. Kramer enjoys introducing students to the wonders of the wilds and from deserts to tropical forests to tundra. He conducts research on the brown recluse spider and remains a, and maintains a website dedicated to educated, educating the public about them. Trudy Peterson earned her BS and MA in interpersonal and public communication from Central Michigan University and her PhD in communication studies from Bowling Green State University in 1998 and joined the faculty at Monmouth College that same year. She serves as the chair of the communication studies department and coordinator of the women's studies program. Trudy's research interests are varied but include the feminist narrative, intercultural communication, family communication, and more recently, creative nonfiction. Trudy and Ken met at Monmouth College and they'll celebrate their 20th wedding anniversary next month. They led the Merida Mexico program for our uh, for Mama two years ago, and we're super excited to learn more about their experience and spend some time with them. So Trudy and Ken, the floor is yours. Great. All right, thank, thank you. you. Well, I'm just gonna go ahead and share the screen to start a little presentation on Merida. We were asked to talk a little bit about Cinco de Mayo and include some food. So this is gonna be more than just Merida. Uh, some of you may have actually seen our Merida presentation before. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna share the screen and hopefully there'll be something there in a minute. In about three seconds, it should show up. Okay, still have to open the presentation. <laughs> It'll all happen here eventually. There we go. Uh, can everybody see that all right? It says Mexico, a pozole of cultures. I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so a pozole of cultures, we chose that uh, title because a pozole is a stew. It's a corn stew actually made with hominy and then some kind of meat. It depends upon where you are, but it's a mixture. So we just wanted to emphasize that Mexico isn't one place. So there isn't really just a Mexican culture. These are the students who were uh, with us on the trip and there's a church in downtown Merida there on the right. And of course the Mexican flag. So just to orient you, this is where Mexico is, what it looks like. Merida is in the lower right-hand corner there in the red on the Yucatan Peninsula in the state of Yucatan. There's 31 states in Mexico, so it's very diverse uh, politically and culturally and economically, all those things. And yeah. people in Merida consider themselves to be Yucatecan first and Mexican second. So there's a big regional identity um, that's tied to Mayan culture and Mayan heritage. Yeah, absolutely. So that actually goes into with one of my next slides. It's just give you an idea of the size too, right? Like 
if you were talking about American culture, it would certainly be different in California than it would be in Florida or Maine versus Texas, right? So the same thing applies to Mexico. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about the program and then get some more into some of that diversity of Mexico, Mexican culture, and Mexican food as an expression of that culture. So just so you know what the program's like, it's only in the spring semester. Students take four classes. They take one in Spanish conversation for obvious reasons. They're expected to have at least 102 level, preferably 201 level of uh, Spanish in their pockets already before they go. Uh, they take another course in Spanish uh, culture, such as in art or history. And then the director, which um, when we went was me, teaches two general education courses in their specialty. So students are getting, usually working towards a Spanish minor or major along with some other major, they can still get their gen ed stuff done. I went on sabbatical. So I got to explore the amazing city of Merida and go on all the excursions and it was, it was, if you can vacation there, I highly recommend it. It's a magical city. Yeah, it's very cool. And it's a big city. Well, it's not very cool. It's very warm, actually. Uh, the students get homestays, so they stay with a Mexican family. Uh, we go on several excursions. They usually, like every two weeks, we would go somewhere else. And I've talked more about those in another presentation. I'm not going to say too much about those tonight. But if you have questions about where we went, uh, it was mostly in the Yucatan Peninsula, but we also went to Cuba. You can ask us about that as well. And the cost for students is very reasonable. It's the same as attending Monmouth. So why wouldn't you go to Mexico, even the airfares included? Okay, so again, just back to the diversity, obviously, since I'm a biologist, you have to put up this map uh, to look at the different types of ecosystems, right? All the way from deserts to grasslands to coniferous forests. So in the center, would be some place kind of like Colorado and then the Northwest would be more like Arizona. And then you have tropical forest down uh, more in the South, even some cloud forests and mangroves along the Caribbean coast. So lots of diversity of ecosystems. And that's uh, primarily because of the diversity of the topography. Um, there are two major mountain ranges, both the Sierra Madre, the Western and the Eastern, Occidental and Oriental and a high plateau in between that, and then all the coastal, coastal regions, which are much uh, lower elevation. And then, of course, quite a, a latitudinal variation. So you, you could definitely get snow in Mexico if you're in the right place. Although Merida's average temperature is, what, 90 degrees? That's about what it was when we were there. And we were there from January to April. And I just got an email from someone down there who said, oh, my God, we're suffering this week. I had to look up the conversion, but it was 111 degrees. So, so we didn't get much over 105 while we were there. So, and, 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 we, and the place where we rented had a pool. So I lived in that pool. Yeah. So Mexican culture is as varied as the native people who uh, live there. And you can see by just from the different colors on this map, the blue, of course, is the Mayan culture, uh, which is where we were in uh, the Yucatan. And um, then, of course, the influence of the Spanish as well, right, the conquistadors. So just to clarify a couple things, uh, Cinco de Mayo is not Mexican Independence Day. That's sort of a common misconception in uh, the U.S. It's really just a celebration of the Battle of Puebla back in 1862 when Napoleon and French forces were uh, trying to take over Mexico. They actually... Were, had outnumbered the Mexicans and had better artillery and better stuff and the Mexicans won. So they celebrate that even though ultimately they lost subsequent battles of Puebla and the French marched all the way to Mexico City and there was a um, emperor type person put in charge for a while. Okay, um, so really their big celebration is just like ours, it's Independence Day, which is September 16th. Yeah, and Cinco de Mayo is mostly celebrated in the United States, um, more so than in Mexico. Exactly. If you look for Cinco de Mayo in Mexico, you would probably find it only in Puebla. Okay, so that brings us to food, because that's what we're going to talk about most tonight. So if you want to, if you want to know more about the program, uh, you can ask about that. So these are all things we think of as Mexican food, but they aren't. You know, burritos, hard shell tacos, chimichangas, burritos, queso dip nachos, none of that stuff is Mexican food. You won't find that uh, 
in Mexico typically. So what is it? Uh, I apologize for not the slideshow not working quite the way I want it to. So all this stuff is up here at once. I like to bring things in a little bit at a time, but you can see some of the different aspects to um, Mexican food. It's very diverse. It depends upon where you are in Mexico, right? You don't get chitlins typically in Illinois, right? Um, and you don't get those big smashed pork tenderloins in Florida either. So there are regional variations in Mexico as well, but they use a lot of fresh ingredients. One of the things we ate a lot, if you look at the third line is chaya, and we'll show a picture of that. It's um, an herb. Spinach. Yeah, kind of like spinach that they purport a lot of magical med medicinal powers to it, but it just really tastes good too. And they serve it a lot of different ways in drinks and also in empanadas. You're not going to find cheddar cheese. You're going to find fresh white cheese called cotija. Um, lots of different types of peppers, a lot of meat in certain parts. Um, could be lamb, could be beef, could be goat. So barbacoa and birria, I'll show you some pictures of those. In certain parts of Mexico, you'll find moles. Uh, and there are different types of mole sauces. Some of them are really sweet and actually have chocolate in them. Some of them are spicier. So there's red moles, green moles, yellow moles. Right. A lot of times the ground seeds that are in there as a base are pepitas, pumpkin seeds, which we are also commonly eaten in um, the Yucatan. And then, of course, you got all your uh, tropical fruits and vegetables, which I just love. Trudy especially like the maracuya ice cream, right? Mm -hmm. I would get that almost every night because it was uh, so tart. Um, it's my favorite. <laughs> and then there's weird stuff like chapulines, which are crickets. Uh, Huitlacoche, which is a fungus that grows on corn, so it's basically like a mushroom, but it's kind of purplish colored. And then a classic Mayan dish that Trudy enjoyed, I'm vegetarian, so I didn't eat it, but uh, is cochinita pibil, which is a Mayan dish made with pork. Can I say more about that? Yeah, they cook it underground in this, this underground kind of stove. I wanted to make that for you all or demonstrate it, but Ken wouldn't dig an uh, um, underground grill for me <laughs> in time for tonight. So, but that was my absolute favorite dish and it cut, they cook it with sour orange and achote, um, one of the spices. Yeah. And if you think of some of the things that are common throughout Mexico, I mean, two of the probably staples that you would find everywhere would be corn and beans. With those two, uh, you can get your full complement of amino acids and you don't necessarily need to eat meat. So we're gonna prepare some fresh corn tortillas later tonight, uh, but there's also a drink called atole that's usually drunk around Christmas time that's made out of corn. So it's kind of like, um, how do I describe it? It's kind of a thick, gruelly corn thing, but it also has uh, cinnamon and brown sugar in it. So it's kind of sweet. What was that? Orchata stuff that you drank. It was like- Orchata is made from, oh. uh, that's too sweet for Trudy, but I love it. It was uh, like, it's consistency like a watered down yogurt and it oh it was just nasty it's made with rice Sorry. rice milk basically and a lot of sugar i wasn't <laughs> a fan so here's a picture of some of those things so wheat lacoche is the um smut the corn smut i was telling you about you can see it on the corn in the upper left and then on grilled and on a um tortilla on the right which I, in the center top there which i've had before and then chapulines are sold kind of as a snack. You know, you get them salted, you can get them barbecued, you come in little bags and you can just carry them around with the end snack on those. Those I are have, the crickets. Yeah, I have photos of the students eating the crickets. Um, oh, some were more adventurous yeah. than others. Oh, can I didn't this? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Whoops. There's the atole in the middle, the sort of corn porridgey drink. Those is kind of thick, but uh, very tasty. And then barbacoa. Could be any kind of meat that's shredded again it's that slow cooking type thing usually underground over coals and then the pozole which led to the title of our talk here you can see the hominy those larger corn kernels in there and uh, some kind of meat and then fresh vegetables on top so mine culture uh some of the things that the students do obviously these pictures are kind of screwed up because of the way it <laughs> presented, but you've probably seen pyramids from the Mayan culture. So we saw a lot of that. And uh, with the closest one to where we were was Guzmal. So 
that makes sometimes people think, well, Mayan culture is just this old dead civilization. But the fact is that the Mayans are very active and they still speak their own language throughout the Yucatan Peninsula and they're very proud of their Mayan heritage. There is still, I would say, some prejudice against Mayans and they tend to um, not get the higher paying jobs, that kind of stuff treated a little bit differently, especially if they only speak Mayan and don't speak Spanish. We went to see a traditional uh, Mayan man, Don Hernan, who's over 80 years old, has never slept in anything but a hammock. Uh, he was showing the students some of the things in his garden there on the left. And then on the right, he's using sisal, or the, uh, to make, or he's making sisal from the henequen plants, uh, which is a fiber. And he uh, made it in like two seconds and then wrapped it into a little rope. Oh. Yeah. He uh, was also a medicine man and showed us some of the rituals um, of Mayan culture that um, kind of that religious belief or spiritual belief. We, the students and I, the, one of our excursions was to Sispichen, which is a traditional Mayan village. So <laughs> out in the more rural area in a small population, sort of like the Monmouth of Yucatan, <laughs> but they still had a lot of their own traditions. And again, I apologize for the pictures kind of overlapping here, um, <clears throat> but they're getting a, a lecture underneath a Seba tree, which has a lot of spiritual significance there, basically connecting the underworld to the upper world. And then in the center, you can see a little picture of some of the Mayan alphabet. We were learning to the different uh, vowel pronunciations and trying to learn just a little bit of Mayan. And then we had fun with the kids, played games with them. I think, I don't remember what the one in the upper right was called, but you tie a balloon to your ankle and everybody runs around trying to smash each other's balloon. So it was a blast, especially when it's a hundred degrees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the Yucatecan food or traditional Mayan cuisine. First of all, of course, like many places that you'll go in the tropics, there are fresh open markets. So again, cooking with fresh foods is fresh ingredients is very common. Although, you know, supermarkets are becoming more common in some of the upper scale places, you know, people shop at supermarkets and don't get as much fresh food. But even if we went to the Walmart, right, we could get fresh tropical fruits there. And then every day at around the same time, a guy would drive a bicycle by our house and he had a certain sound of bell and it was the bread guy. And he would come around and Ken would buy sweets or bread from him every night. So, and there's also vendors that come around and sharpen knives and they have a different sounding bell. And then there's women who carry fruit or fruit drinks uh, around and sell those as well. Yeah, if you saw the movie Roma and they hear the sound, uh, that sound of someone going down the street, that was a knife sharpener sound. <laughs> But Pedro was my man. He was my bread supplier. I, I, I visited him a lot. Or he visited us. Yeah, he visited us. That's true. I would just, oh, Pedro's coming. We've got to run out. It's kind of like the ice cream man, only even better. Yes. Uh, so here's some of the foods we sampled. Um, again, on the left is the classic Mayan dish, cochinita pibil, which is uh, shredded pork. Again, cooked slow underground with some other, you want to talk about any of the other stuff on the plate? No, no but they always, on every table in the restaurant you would go to, they have a salsa with habanero. Habanero seems to be the predominant chili in Merida and the Yucatan. So really spicy. I remember trying some on, on once and, and the man who waited on us called me very brave. <laughs> and then the dish on the right is called huevos motuleños, named after the town Motul. Um, apparently, uh, some chef was visiting from Europe and had this and asked the chef, well, what do you call this? And he didn't really know. It was just stuff they made. So he said, uh, huevos motuleños, because there are eggs in there underneath the, the tortillas. There's also a tomato sauce, some plantains, uh, peas, and a little bit of ham in there. So it was one of the few things I could eat if I scraped off the ham and gave it to Trudy. Because <laughs> eggs, I'm, I'm cool with eating those. All right, so a couple other things. Uh, on the left is a squash soup, which was really yummy. And we got that like a block from our house. And some panuchos, which are 
kind of like empanadas up there on top and I could get some vegetarian ones of those. And then on the right is a big meaty stew that Trudy got. I'm not sure I remember the name. I don't yeah. remember either, but it's lentils and, and stuff. But the, the important thing is the chaya. If you see the green drink oh, yeah. that's made with a spinach-like um, herb and then my tortilla to the left on the left of the plate, that's made with chaya as well. And I feel like I have been using tortillas wrong most of my life because you know, I would see uh, people eating and they would roll up their tortilla in like a tube like that and use it as a utensil um, rather than like a taco and stuffing it. It was just, right. they would roll it up and, and use it to kind of scoop food. And also a good way to clean your bowl when you're done because you want to get every drop. All right, so, more, so now students involved with uh, cooking food, we made some, uh, well, Doña Susie showed us how to make salsa. That's what she's working on there on the right. But on the left, you can see tuxol, which is a unique Mayan dish. Uh, Trudy made some tonight, so we'll get to see some fresh tuxol. It's made with ibes, which are fresh beans that are kind of like lima beans, and then ground up pepitas, the pumpkin seeds, and chives, and maybe something else. I don't know. No, nope, that's it. Okay. They're, they're, can often be cilantro and things, but Trudy doesn't like that. That so. didn't have cilantro. And then you have to eat it with the, the homemade salsa. I didn't make homemade salsa either, but with with the um, ingredients um, roasted over grilled and then smashed with the, what is that thing? A mortar and pestle, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so here's the students are roasting some yeah. of the ingredients on the left. Uh, Connie is roasting some pepitas. There, that little table you see there and the little black sort of triangle trapezoid in there is uh, the coals, keeping that nice and hot. And then on the right, Taylor is roasting some peppers as well, some habaneros. But the, probably the most exciting thing we did, I thought, and one of the most laborious, which uh, Mayans do every day, is to make fresh corn masa and corn tortillas. So to make the corn masa, you have to wash the corn a bunch of times, which is what the students are doing on the left. They're washing it by hand to remove the little husks around each kernel. And then you have to grind it. That's what we're doing on the right. And that's done twice. You have to send it through twice to get it nice and fine. So Doña Susi, here we had a video, but I'm sorry, it's not going to work. It shows how she pats it out by hand, and uh, I'll be doing that later anyway. But it's not like Doña Susi. No, these the Mayan <laughs> women make hundreds of tortillas every day, and they grind the corn every day to make them. Um, Doña Susi right there, um, she came up to about Ken's belly button. Um, <laughs> Ken and I are tall in the United States. We were really tall in the Yucatan. Yeah. Yeah, she's a typical Mayan stature though. So I thought I would also uh, talk a little bit about um, tequila, why not? Uh, because that's sort of a, a drink that we associate with Mexico. It's named after a town actually in Northwestern, uh, well, in Jalisco, the state of Jalisco, Northwest of Guadalajara. So tequila is a type of mezcal, basically. Mezcal can be made from any agave plant. And so it can be highly varied in its flavor, depending on where it's grown, what type of agave, how they treat it. But tequila specifically has to be made out of 100% blue agave, or at least to be called tequila, at least 51%, uh, in which case it's called mixto, right? It's mixed. So when you buy tequila, a lot of times if you buy the, the quote, better stuff, yeah, it'll say right on there in big letters, 100% blue agave. Um, so when it comes out, it's supposed to, it's typically clear, like most uh, green alcohols, right? Uh, well, it's not a green. <laughs> we'll show some pictures in a minute. But most alcohols come out clear, but the color would come from aging in oak barrels, or uh, sometimes they cheat and just add some colors. If you're looking for the worm, it's just a gimmick. Uh, there's no way a worm would sub survive the process. There are worms that infest the agave plant and that's usually the one they put in the bottles as kind of a, that gimmick. But if you actually had in plants infested with the worms, you wouldn't choose those for making <laughs> your tequila <laughs> or your mezcal. So the different sort of levels of tequila, um, I have some out that we'll show later. Some blanco or plata is the clear stuff that hasn't been aged very long. So it may be a little harsher, but it also has a lot of different flavors in it. 
And then the longer you rest it, so reposado is rested, so two months to a year. Añejo is aged or vintage, that's one to three years. And then extra añejo, which is about $100 a bottle, is aged a minimum of three years. So the longer it's rested, the smoother it gets. But uh, some people think it takes out too much of the complexity of the flavor. Other people like it older. So, you know, and of course, if you don't have any money, you like Blanco. <laughs> so this is what the blue agave plant looks like. And this is a uh, harvesting. They cut off the leaves and then you just use the central piña uh, and that is roasted. And then it forms the base of the sugars for the fermentation to take place. So here's an example of some different types of tequilas from Blanco to a very fine extra añejo on the right, uh, which we have an empty bottle of. Unfortunately, I didn't get to empty it. We got it from friends uh, who said it was the best tequila they've ever had. So look for Cava de Oro, C-A-V-A -A de Oro, and uh, you might be able to get it for 90 bucks. All right. So the last thing we're going to do, and... Um, is make some tortillas. So I'll leave this up for a little bit and talk about it. And then I think we're gonna to transition to just me making the tortillas. So you take a couple cups of masa harina, so which just means corn flour. Uh, so you don't want corn muffin or corn meal mix because that's not fine enough. You want the nice fine flour. And it will, it'll say masa harina on the package and you can get that at most stores. It was easy to find in Monmouth. So two cups of that with one and a half cups of hot water. I like to dissolve my uh, salt in it first, a half a little teaspoon of salt, and that's it. You just mix it by hand. If it's a little bit too sticky, you add some more flour. If it's too dry, you add a little water. Then you roll it in the ping pong size balls to make about six inch diameter um, tortillas. <laughs> and you press them between plastic so it doesn't stick and you can easily peel it off and throw it onto a hot griddle. So yeah, I'm gonna stop the share and then uh, Trudy will be able to video me doing this stuff. And oh, go ahead and get the, the pan heated heat up. Get a big pan heated up for you. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop the share. Yay, okay. So. I don't know if we should ask for questions now or maybe after. Now and after, Trudy says, I don't know. Hey, if anyone has any questions, please um, type them in the chat to all panelists and I can read them to Ken and Trudy. Let me see if we have any, hang on. Tell me when I'm on, huh? You're on. All right, I'm on. Well, so Let's just see if there's any questions. See if there's any questions first. Or they can hold until the end. Okay. Well, All I right. do know that um, Zach Edmonds is planning dinner at your house for homecoming. Okay. So I'll be there too. Okay. Awesome. Right. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a big Mexican feast. Oh, here we have one. Another from Zach. What was your absolute favorite dish? Um, mine was the cochinita pibil, um, the pork roasted underground. Um, Ken, what was yours? Mm, I should have been prepared for that question. I'm not sure I know what my favorite dish was. You can probably think oh, of it. I remember those gorditas at that corner shop in Central. Those were really awesome, too. We did swim in a cenote, too. Sorry, I'm seeing yes. Jan's question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, you have to swim in a cenote. Uh, for people who don't know, those are the, you know, the um, topography in the Mayan Peninsula is very much like it is in Kentucky. A lot of, uh, although flatter, <laughs> a lot of limestone and the limestone is very porous and dissolved. So there's underground caves and caverns and then these little pits that fill with fresh water that are just gorgeous and beautiful to swim in. So they're very popular, sometimes too popular. They can get populated and you know, crowded and a little polluted if too many people visit them. So with the corn tortillas, again, you start with the uh, corn flour right? Any brand will do, but it has to say on there somewhere, masa harina, okay? And of course, it's all gluten-free free because it's corn, it's not wheat, so don't let that throw you. All right, so I put a couple uh, cups of that in there. You can see how it's uh, pretty fine, okay? Very powdery. And got my one and a half cups of water with my uh, 
salt dissolved in it already. So just pour that in there and then mix by hand. Feels like I got too much water in there, but it looks like it's gonna to come together. So yeah, that might be a little mushy. Aside from the crickets, what other adventurous things do we eat? Oh yeah. I think the corn smut stuff, the corn um, fungus. Yep, wheat lacoche. Yeah. That's really tasty. I mean, I'm not too excited about the crickets, but the, the wheat lacoche is good. Yeah, and like the hortada, the thick drinks, I wasn't a fan of, but that students liked them, kind of liked it. Um, I like it a little bit. So I just added a little more corn flour because it felt a little too sticky to me. So we'll work that in. I'm going to walk around here. Maybe you can Sorry. see it. I made an attempt to make toxo, which is um, the ibis bean we don't have. And so I substituted lima beans and then pepitas ground up. I didn't make my own salsa, but it's all right. So after Ken gets the tortillas made, that'll be dinner for us. Mm -hmm. um, in um, Merida, the big meal is at lunchtime. And so people have a big lunch and usually a really small dinner. So we would typically eat out a lot. We didn't cook very much um, when we were there. Sorry. So uh, one way to do this, you can do it on a single piece of plastic or I had one of these prepped yesterday, but I have to do it again. Uh, you can cut open a bag, just cut along the side. So you can put your ball of flour in the middle and then squish it on both sides with the... Uh, I don't think he should have his own cooking show. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so get up here and show this up close, hon. This is, the, this is the fun part. So you get to mash out your corn clear. and you can kind of pinch the edges as you go so they don't crack too much. Uh, the main thing is to get it nice and thin. Like this is still way too thick. So I got to get it out. Donia Susi wouldn't approve. We had the students and we were trying to make our own tortillas hey. and the, they would look at them and kind of shake their head and then she would correct some of them. Um, she complimented me on mine, I'm yeah, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Next mine time were get thinner to... than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've read is that to uh, determine if your pan is hot enough, follow me over here, hon. You can hold your hand Don't above burn it. Yourself. And it feels pretty freaking hot. Um, or you can drop some water on it. I just hold my hand over it. That's yeah. good enough. Fry his hand. And then peel off your. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> this worked better yesterday. <laughs> yeah, maybe I got it a little too moist. <laughs> oh. I don't shucks. think Ken's kitchen is going to be. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm not gonna make. All right. While well, he's messing around with that, I'll talk about something more interesting. Um. <laughs> Um, I bought this, this um, sunflower um, piece of art in Merida. There are these esquinas or quadros throughout town that are these squares on the sides of buildings on corners. And they demark, or they, they, they show directions. What, where something used to be. So for instance, on one corner, there is a parrot, one of a parrot um, and it had a little sign next to it explaining that this was the site of a store where the owner had a blind parrot. So I started seeing these squares all over the city. Um, they're a little bit bigger than, than the replica that I have right there. And um, I started taking photographs not knowing what they were. And then I happened to run into our students in Centro downtown. Um, they were in a class. And they were looking for these quadros all over town for one of their art classes. And they told me that there were 168 of them and a photographer had created a map of these quadros. And so it became my sabbatical project to find and photograph all 168 of them. And I found over 100 by myself without using the map. And then I had to resort to the map for the last 68. Um, I still want to do something like a poster or something like that. Maybe have one of our students in public relations or maybe an art student in 
um, design, make a poster for me of my photographs of all the quadros that I, I took photos of and I walked all over town. Yeah, yeah Abby, I did average like 40,000 steps a day, if not more. Um, all right, we're gonna make this happen. All right, he's finally, Ken's Kitchen, maybe, yeah. You see this? Hey. Yeah, that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Woo oh. That's not hot back there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you turned the bulb on. No. That's all, right. all right, this is amateur hour. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, that's all good. I'm just gonna wait and make one more and uh, float it on there. And it, she should cook it about one to two minutes on each side. But basically, it's pretty hard to burn, which is good for someone like me. And <laughs> you can just check it every once in a while. It should get a little golden brown on the underside and start to maybe bubble just a little. And then you can put them uh, as you're doing them. Put them on a clean like kitchen towel and that'll keep the moisture in them so they don't get dry and crackly. And then after you're done, it, you know, if you don't heat them fresh, you can um, put them into a Ziploc bag. And well, maybe I did nice. turn that on, it's smoking. Yeah, I think so. Huh? Yeah, now, let me see, let me get a spatula. That's all good. too hot. Yeah, I thought you could tell how hot it was by just touching it. Hey, don't get me angry. <laughs> don't try this at home, kids. Oh, that's why we're doing this. All right. All right, I think they get it. Well, I gotta make one more. We have to eat one. Okay. Are there questions while we're watching Ken do this? All right, yeah, I think we can probably, uh, we can turn this back on after one's done, so we can okay. take questions now. Oh, well, show them your talk. Soon. I did. Oh, okay. So do we want to make everyone appear? Yes. Why don't I go in and make, um, promote everyone to panelists. So bear with me. You'll probably have to okay. accept it once I do that. Um, Takes me a couple minutes, so just. Right. Kitty cats. Oh, yeah, I was gonna show them some tequila. Mm -hmm. Too late? No. So here's just basic silver tequila, silver Patron. So it's not even a reservado, reposado or añejo. So it's not that old. Okay, so it's fresh, so it's gonna have a little sharper. This is the cara de oro, which would look more, much browner, almost like tea. That's a hundred dollar bottle. Yeah, which clearly we didn't buy, but I'm gonna buy one as a celebration for, uh, you know. Our anniversary? Um, no. Oh. <laughs> Uh, this Karen. one's coming out really good now. All right. I've got the temperature just right. Check this out. Come over and film this one. This looks good. Oh, I guess I'm the camera person now. Yeah, that looks. That one looks good. Look at that. It's getting nice little golden brown there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It smells good. Yeah. Oh, it smells, it smells yummy. I don't think Donia Susi would approve. They're a little thick. Well, she's not here, is she? <laughs> Judge. Feel bad. That's my wife's job. <laughs> All right, questions. If folks have questions, more questions about the program, about the where we went. Hey, Abby. Guys, I have a question, and this is more high level. I'm just curious how logistically a program like this comes together. Uh, how early do you have to start planning for this, Ken? <laughs> oh, oh, for the Merida program. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I started probably the summer before. Definitely by September and October, things are really ratcheting up. Uh, 
start to figure out, well, we figured out where we were going to live, I think in June, because we needed to find a you know, decent place that we could have for that long. So we got up, that up front. And then I had to recruit students and then he had to figure out what courses he was going to teach because um, he taught some general education courses down there. So students don't lose any time by going off campus. And, you know, so they got some of their, they got their reflections class, they got uh, their art participation, their beauty and meaning. And so we coordinated or it's coordinated really well so that students by going abroad can still take courses that count toward their Monmouth graduation requirements. That's your cat, Abby, that's crying like that. Let's see him. Let's see him. <laughs> he shouldn't be on the counter. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that All looks right. pretty good. Okay. So that you want to eat? Go ahead. So a little toxin in here. Oh, he's going to eat the toxin, which also isn't as good as what Donia Susie would make. <laughs> well, Ooh, hot. Uh, we do have one more question. Do they use uh, tortilla presses at all? What's that? Do they use tortilla presses? No, no. She just, and she, um, the, the Mayan women we saw making tortillas, they would use a, a square piece of plastic wrap. They wouldn't even use anything on top of it and they just do it with their hands. And they did hundreds of these a day. Wow. No tortilla press. So you talked about lunch and dinner. What about breakfast? Do they eat breakfast? Yeah, yeah, um, I just mostly eggs and stuff. I don't know, I didn't get up in time for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And lots of pastries, lots of, you know, not sweet pastries as well. Right. Sometimes just coffee with a, a bread that's again, not a really sweet bread. Mm -hmm. And my friend uh, Alfredo from Durango actually said that sometimes you would have a tole for breakfast and that would be it. It's kind of like a porridge, kind of like a corn porridge. I mean, it's thick enough. It's kind of like cream of wheat, only it's cream of corn. What about accommodations for students while they were there? What did that look like for them? They lived with host families. So two of them would live with the same family. And so they would, the family would feed them um, three meals, two or three meals a day. Yeah, three. three meals a day. And so they got the more authentic sort of cuisine. Um, it was kind of tough on our vegetarians because um, people eat a lot of meat. And so um, one student, she was not getting enough nutrients and um, her host mom had to have a couple conversations with the director of the program down there about more beans and more proteinaceous kinds of foods so that she had enough food to eat. Yeah. She would feed her what she considered a vegetarian diet, but it wasn't a very healthy vegetarian diet just yeah. because they're not accustomed to that. But it's a very pork-centric culture in the, the peninsula. Mm -hmm. We took a trip to a, a pork, um, not a processing plant, but where they rear the pigs. They have those, they have, just like we have in the Midwest. I remember when we flew in on the plane, I saw all these enclosures. I'm like, man, that looks like a pork, um, what do you call that, where they rear the A farm? Yeah. <laughs> fancy uh, resorts on the in Cancun. I, he says, now I know what all that cochinita is paying for. I was like, yeah, these guys are making big bucks off of this. And his wife, that's their kitchen. It's really unusual. It's like it's in <laughs> this modeled um, probably three years ago. Before you're into it. Oh, it's going to be over at the, at the five. Other questions? I guess we must have just done such a thorough job. Does anybody yeah. have questions? 
Zach, is, do you have your little ones with you? Does Zoe have a question? Hey. Zoe, you want to <laughs> have any question about the food? Hey, Zoe. They had tacos. <laughs> Ask them if they had tacos. Ask them. They're making tacos. Tell them you like tacos. I like tacos. <laughs> awesome. And tequila. And tequila. Smart kid. And tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have a question? I'm just watching Ken. All right. Marilyn, do you have a question? Young, don't have any questions. Jim and Jim. Brett, you don't have a question? <laughs> hey, Jim. I guess you don't use any um any oil on your grill, do you griddle, do you? No. That, that's that's the, the Mayan way as well. Yeah. No way did, did they use a griddle, uh, a non-stick griddle down there? I don't know if it was non-stick. They yeah. just had that pan on top of coal. Yeah, it looked like mm. it looked almost like it was an aluminum pan, but it could have been some other metal. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really know, but I know, I'm pretty sure it's not non-stick. Uh, just get it so hot. That this mixture of corn flour and water is not going to stick. So, uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, it's very simple. That's all there is in there. It's just corn yeah. flour. I'm going to try that. Yeah. 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 Before going there, I always ate flour tortillas, but the corn tortillas there are just amazing. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Uh, For people that can't eat wheat too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the wheat tortillas obviously is a more recent, you know, invention in, in Mexico. Yeah. It's been adopted a little bit more in some of the northern parts of Mexico, I read, but by and large, if you ask for tortillas, corn. Why not is corn? Is, is the Mexican food then here in the States pretty much ruined for you guys now? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. it was, it's yeah. just, it's more Tex-Mex. It's not really. Yeah. Awesome. Which is sometimes tasty. <laughs> yeah. yeah one of my places to, to eat lunch was a Cuban place called La Cubanita. And they were the place that gave salad and just, um, they would have like three or four options for the day. And that was my favorite place to go for lunch. Oh, Jan, it looked like you were going to say something. Jan, I saw you on the camera briefly. Ours was the question about the cenote. Oh, yeah. We went to a couple cenotes with the students. Um, they are, um, what is the pollution issue? Um, some of the pork farms are... Um, the sewage from the pork plant farms, the, the, that kind of uh, geology is very porous. That's why there's those mm -hmm. snow flex, but they're all connected underground. So if you have a, a sewage uh, storage from the pork processing, or not processing plants, mm -hmm. but curing plants, um, that can easily get into the groundwater. So, you know, there were actually protests while we were there about that. And of course, you know, the yeah, big part of the right. public hearing everyone that, no, oh, they take precautions and they've got things lined and it's not going to go out anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And we actually went and saw that part of the, the pork rearing pot, uh, process as well. We saw the sewage treatment lagoons. And yeah, but the snow taste, I, I mean, Hopefully they can preserve them because they are just gorgeous. Um, and just so, mm. such yep. water. Yeah. Did you go to any other neat field trip locations like um, Chichen Itza or uh, Tulum? Or Tulum? Um, we did not. Um, Chichen Itza, Ken and I had been there before. Um, what was the one? Ushmal was our favorite. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Oh, we, we went, went to, to Chichen Itza on the way to Calakmul, which is almost oh. in uh, Guatemala. It's, mm. um, you can actually see El Mirador from there, which is one of the largest ones in Guatemala. So if you climb to the top of the um, pyramid in Calakmul, which I went because I was hoping to see a jaguar. A jaguar had um, sure. unfortunately eaten someone's dog about a week before we got there. Someone, uh, a young woman who was hiking by herself except for with her dog, was told she couldn't bring the dog into the park and she tied it up on a tree outside. Don't tell the story. Yeah. Oh. So that didn't work out well for the dog, unfortunately. So yeah, we, we did, um, Uchmal I think was my favorite um, um, place um, yeah. that was relatively close. Uchmal, Uchmal, yeah. Uchmal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Actually, our guide said he preferred Uchmal to Itza. He said it had more interesting yeah. stuff going on there. And not as many tourists. That's where we saw the ball court. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah we saw ball courts. Yeah, oh yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, there too. Was, but I think it was a small voice, a really big one went down in it. Yeah, and, and we also went to Cuba for um, a week, was it? Oh, wow. Yeah. Where? Cuba. Cuba. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was interesting as well. And we stayed kind of with not really host families, but with families um, in, in Havana um, and and traveled around a bit in, oh, in in, in Cuba. Neat. Um, what's the average group size, guys? So if there hadn't been enough student interest for Monmouth, would you have combined that program with another school? Um, there were other schools down there. There's um, Center College, where um, President <laughs> Wyatt was before here. There is um, Center College. Yeah. You're not, you're not um, Central College from Iowa. Yeah. Oh, Central has their own year-round thing. They have their own house and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but they all would come at to the same sort of center for classes. So there was a little bit of intermingling between the different programs. And we also traveled to Cuba with the students at the college. Yeah. So we had a bigger numbers to keep the price down. You know? But I think how many students went when we were there? Seven? We had eight. We had eight. And, and, and I think 11 students are interested in going next year, a year from now. There were 11 the year before us, the very first year, because it was only the first year, there were only five. But uh, yeah, so around you know, 10 to 15, that would be a good hopeful number. Yeah, I would love to go back. It was a great experience. So you offer this every other year? Every year. Every year. Every spring. Every spring. The city is so absolutely walkable. I walked everywhere and I walked at night. Um, there's just, there's, it's just a safe, walkable city. And I just, it seemed like whenever I go out walking, I, I would encounter something I didn't know was going on, like dancing in Centro every Sunday. There's family dancing on Saturdays. They block off the main drag in Merida so that families can bike. Um, so without cars um, around, it's called Bici Ruta. And so it's just a very family-centered city. Um, just lots and lots of activities all the time. And Trudy, is it an entire semester or just um, a, a part of a semester? It's the whole semester. The whole semester. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So I, obviously nobody's traveling right now because of the pandemic, but is there conversation already being had and the planning, is that already starting or are you guys on hold waiting for um, next steps from the administration? How does that look? It, it looks like they're planning to go next spring. Yep. Nice. So, yep. Um, Mexico, in terms of COVID relief, they haven't had, they don't have access to the vaccine as much as we do, but hopefully by a year from now, that will have changed. And certainly most of our students would be vaccinated before they went anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know about the fall international programs for our students. That's still up in the air. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Did, did they eat this uh, food? I can't think of the name of it. It's made with corn mash and it has um, corn husks wrapped around it and it's steamed. Oh, and they put ep epizote or 
uh, maybe chicken, just different things in it and steam it for a long time. And then you unwrap the corn and eat it. Yeah, yeah, those are tamales. And oh, those are tamales. Okay, okay. So my son lived down there for two years in Mexico City, though. Okay. And, and, he, uh, with a, and he lived with a, a couple of Mexican students. Uh, he worked for a while for the news, which is owned by Carlos Slim. And he um, met some university students and they lived together and they had a person, a lady come in and clean uh, their apartment and they gave, gave her $50. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, and he asked her to teach him some Mexican cooking. And that was one of the things she taught him. So he gave her $50 for doing that. And she went home at Christmas and for her town of 200, she made those things oh, and just all around distributed them to to um, the people in the town <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean things are are cheap down there food is really cheap um and we had somebody come in and clean our place once a week and it, i don't remember how much or it was came with our rent um but yeah and I, the people who helped us or showed us how to make things at the at the school um also reasonably <laughs> Price and there are quite a few expats there. There's a lot from Canada actually who come down for maybe six months of the year, especially people who can work remotely. Um, so they would show up and take off. Yeah. So they have a big art scene too. We didn't mm -hmm. mention that. There's yeah. a lot of art in the in the town, a lot of art galleries. Uh, we went on a sort of art tour where we could walk around and the artists are actually in their spaces. Yeah. So Karen, does your son make tamales for you when he comes home to visit? Well, he did that one night when we were having this party and they really spent a lot of time making those all day. He and his now wife came down. She, at the time he was in Mexico, she was working in Russia. And so she wanted to get out of the cold and she came and visited him in Mexico and they are now married, <laughs> but they did spend a, a lot of time traveling all over South and Central America because he wanted to parlay that into a career nice. kind of thing. Well, yeah. Since you mentioned that, one of our students, uh, she met someone after about two weeks down there, and now she's living down in Mexico. So, you know, I'll find you wherever. <laughs> About two years after graduation, I went to Mexico City, and I can't remember the town exactly, but it was um, near Te Teodoro Iwakan. Does that sound right? Um, and so it was a friend of mine that I worked with, and it was it was very the culture was really traditional. But then they had a little bit of spillover of U.S. culture. There was really big hamburger stand, and everybody gathered there on the weekends. It was really awesome. There's a People eat a lot of hot dogs, I don't understand. I think it's just cheap um, to feed the kids. There's hot dog stands everywhere. And I ordered a- such just, just, I ordered a pizza. We found a pizza place with sausage that came with hot dogs. <laughs> it's just not what I wanted. So. But it's just a very family oriented um, town, Merida is. That, that's something that you could probably say is pretty much true of anywhere in Mexico. Is hot dogs? No, oh. family orientation. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. yes. Very important. Kids are spoiled, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but just, a, I, I don't speak Spanish. I took lessons when I was there and people were so nice and kind and helped me out with, with very little Spanish that I, I tried. And so it was, I, I didn't, yeah, I tried and people were very nice about it. Got to get the Duolingo app, Trudy. I'll send you my link. You get a free uh, two weeks I, or whatever trial. I had that. I, I'm, I relied on my spouse who's bilingual to translate everything. Right, so okay. there you go. <laughs> got a little lazy. But you got around your Ubers just fine. Yeah, I mostly walked when I was by myself. Ken and I took Ubers to go farther away, but when I was on my own, I just walked everywhere. You had to take Ubers to, to finish off your quadros before we left because there were a few she hadn't found. 
I fell when I was in Mexico and I hurt my mm-hmm. leg and um, I, I had to go to the doctor in, in Merida to get an x-ray and I had an x-ray and I met with the doctor that day. It was 125 bucks. I had to pay up front for everything, like crutches, a little you know, leg brace and all of that. Um, so I couldn't walk to find the last four quadros to take photos of them. And so we got an Uber and this, our Uber driver was just kept shaking his head and he told Ken that he must love me very much to indulge such silliness. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I had to find that last four. I got a gold star for that. Yeah, he got a gold star. <laughs> Well, this has been so great. It, does anybody else have questions? River, do you have a question? I haven't seen your face. No. All right, we're just watching Ken's Kitchen. Boring. <laughs> I appreciate everyone <laughs> tuning in for this. What a great hour. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I'm ready to go to Marita. I'm ready also for dinner because it looks delicious. <laughs> So um, what a great experience for our students. I'm so glad that they got to experience that with you. And thanks for sharing it with us tonight. Just want to put a, um, a river looks like he's in his grad class right now, so he can't talk. But I love that he's um, multitasking with us. Oh, um, <laughs> so um, just a couple things to put mark on your calendar. On May 5th, it's a Wednesday night at 6 p.m., Professor Prince and Professor Fasano are leading a talk on energy on a rooftop on solar panels at Monmouth College. So we would love for you to join us. Also May 19th at noon central time, Ed Wimp, class of 12, is leading a talk called Patience and Persistence, Enjoying the Road to Success. So also another great talk. So I hope that you all can join us. Thanks for joining us tonight. Please take the survey, send your feedback. And um, so thank you. Have a great night. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Adios. All right. All right. All right. So great. Thank you so much. All right. Hope it wasn't too much. Ken's still cooking tortillas. Oh, it looks amazing. I can't believe you don't leave.